I think we're now streaming. We are streaming. Hi, everyone. Hugo Bound Anderson here from Coiled um, for Science Thursdays. Um, we're here with our um, special guests and friends, Nicholas Safroniev uh, and, and Tally Lambert, and of course, uh, Matthew Rocklin, um, Dask Guru and CEO of, of, of Coiled. I, I, I haven't seen that eyebrow raised before. I, I, I like that. Um, I guess you're going to introduce themselves in, in a second. I'm going to put on, I, I don't have it on gallery view. I'm going to put on gallery view so we can, I mean, as if the only face you want to see is this one. Um, uh, we'll but just waves to, over again is what I'm hearing. What's that? We we'll have to do our waves over again is what I'm hearing. Yeah, please wave everyone. As I introduce them, we could have a, a big group wave. Um, <laughs> Great, so um, we're here for Science Thursdays where we love talking about everything distributed and, and all, all the wonderful applications of distributed computing, mostly DAS, but a, a bunch of other things um, and, and welcome. I'd love for uh, everyone who's watching to introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, let us know uh, who you are, where you're dialing in from and what your interest is here. Um, are you generally interested in distributed compute um, or is, do you work in, in bioimaging and that's why you're here or a big fan of Napari? Uh, these types of things would be uh, super useful. Um, if you hit subscribe um, on our YouTube channel, that, that'd be cool if you enjoy this, uh, of course. Um, and as always, feel free to ask uh, as many questions um, as you would like in, in the chat. And we will endeavor to get to most of them. Um, I just want to say a bit about Coiled, which um, Matt and I uh, and, and our wonderful engineers um, are, have just opened our beta product, essentially where we are uh, it's hosted deployments in, in, in the cloud. And we manage Dask in the cloud for you, uh, whether it's data analysis, machine learning, a, a bunch of other things. We also handle security, Conda, Docker environments, and, and team management, but we're rapidly iterating on this product and it's currently free. So if this sounds something, like something you'd be interested in, we'd really love uh, for, for you to test it out and, and chat with us about it. So go to coiled.io for, for that. Um, I think that's pretty much... Uh, everything I, I I wanted to say, so I'd love for our guests to introduce themselves, and perhaps we can start with Nick. That was a, I flipped a coin in my head. Great, sure. I actually um, went alphabetical order by first name, but whatever. Nick Safraniev here. Um, I'm leading the uh, imaging tech team at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. It's a, a philanthropy focused on accelerating science, and and there we're thinking about trying to provide um, sort of reproducible bioimage analysis to scientists. Um, and um, I have a background in systems neuroscience and microscopy and I've been working on the Napari project um, for about two years now. Um, and uh, yeah, really excited to talk to you today about uh, interactive image processing. Awesome. Tally? Hi, I'm Tally Lambert. I am a lecturer and microscopist at Harvard Medical School. Uh, work in a core facility. Uh, a lot of, lot of um, users build, build some microscopes, um, mostly help people design experiments and uh, execute them. Um, I've been working on Napari for about a year now, and uh, I think it came out of uh, need, you know, in, in my daily work, and I found it super useful, and um, uh, partly with kind of the stuff we'll be talking about today, just with, uh, you know, slightly larger data sets. Okay, quick naive question. You mentioned a core facility. What is that? Yeah, core facility is a um, facility. Uh, almost every university has a handful of core facilities, if not a lot, where um, if there is some resource that requires hardware or expertise that is perhaps too expensive or, or specialized for any one lab to um, have uh, everything they need, then you know the department or multiple departments will go in on a core facility that. Uh, we'll share the instruments um, with with experts to to either train you how to use them or, or in some cases they do them for you. So genomics cores are very popular, um, you know, uh, sequencing, stuff like that. And microscopy is also a very commonly uh, seen core facility. So I, I want to jump in um, to, to Napari, but before that, I think we all know who, who Matt is now, um, but I always ask Matt, to tell us what Dask is but before we jump in. So Matt, maybe you could, could tell us what Dask is. So the running joke here is that I always dodge that question and defer it to our guests. <laughs> so maybe Nick or Tally, can one of you all define what Dask is? Tally, you didn't you're, see you're, that you're, one coming. Oh, right. Lord, we're waiting for this on the spot. All right, uh, Dask to me is um, uh, 
Dask is, is uh, it, it, it provides distributed computing and, and one of the things I use the most is uh, sort of delayed, uh, a, a way to sort of declaratively wrap uh, uh, procedures that we think of in a, in a, in a delayed um, uh, wrapper such that I can, I can sort of describe my workflow uh, uh, without actually executing it and then, and then execute it in, in parallel, scale it up easily across a, a cluster um, uh, using using Dask, that's what it is to me, at least. I think if I think about like what do I what I sort of love about Dask is it, it lets me have a sort of similar interface to arrays like I'm used to from NumPy, um, but then it also lets me leverage things like um, distributed compute or lazy execution without really having to be so uh, cognizant of that. And um, you know, as someone that comes more from a sort of image analysis. Um, uh, data science uh, background, um, you know, that's just great. And so it's been really fun integrating it with um, with Mapari for the, those reasons. Awesome. So maybe we can jump in, you can tell us a bit about Napari, then we can jump into some notebooks. Yeah, sure. Maybe I'll, I'll say a few words uh, about the project. Um, so, you know, Napari is a multi-dimensional image viewer for uh, Python. And, um, you know, it's sort of born out of um, a need for people that are working with uh, images to actually see them. You know, if you're doing um, um, image analysis, um, you know, often these images might be um, three-dimensional, four-dimensional with time um, and uh, or, or multiple resolutions. And um, there ha haven't been as many solutions for um, kind of interactively exploring images, uh, exploring analysis. Um, but um, that, that go well with Python data analysis uh, and Python machine learning tools. And so, um, yeah, we started working on, uh, on Napari um, and um, to try and provide some of, uh, some of that functionality. Um, Tally, maybe you would say a few words for, from your perspective. Uh, I, I think you nailed it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, let's, let's jump in then. Do you want to kick us off, Tally, with the first yeah, notebook? Sure. And, yeah. Uh, and um, can you see my screen? You can. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'll just I'll just start by saying that what what I'm about to kind of uh, show is is um, uh, basically a notebook form version of of this uh, uh, blog post that that I that I wrote or, or tutorial on our uh, nupari.org um, tutorials page. Uh, and we've posted that um, tutorial page in the chat as well. So if anyone wants to follow along in, in the notebooks as well. Awesome, thank you. And and actually, before I even get into this, I'll say that this, in turn, what I'm about to show you was very much inspired by posts that I read on the Dask blog by uh, by Matt and 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 John Kirkham and others, um, showing very similar um, workflows to, to what I'm about to show you. It's just that it happens to work very nicely with Napari, and um, so uh, I'm my shoulders of of giants here. Um, it's really just a bunch of dwarves stacked up on top of each other. <laughs> <laughs> Multiple but a dwarves. lot of them, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, I mean, so so first I'll just give a very basic. Uh, uh, this is this is Napari. So I'm just going to import Napari and a, and a and a utility that will help me with uh, uh, Jupyter Notebook here, and show you that you know the main the main offering in in Napari is usually accessed through uh, Napari this is the, the main object in, in Napari. And, and Napari, as, as we've said, is sort of first and foremost a viewer for multidimensional data. Um, and there's a handful of built-in readers. So TIFF files are easy to read. And if I just run this, I'm going to just open two local TIFF files. I'll show this in a second. And if you wouldn't mind just um, zooming in a bit or, or, or maximizing that. Absolutely. Great. And also, are those, are there micro, is that some spindle-like behavior or? Sure, or yeah. Yeah, so yes, so this data set that I'm about to show you, um, th there's a reason I'm picking this because I think it sort of, uh, it, um, it, it, it demonstrates one of the things, uh, uh, pre-processing data and viewing data interactively that, that um, I think is, 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 is unique here and, and Dask makes uh, easy for us as developers to, to, to wrap up. But yeah, what we're looking at here is a, cell, a uh, single cell acquired on a lattice light sheet microscope, sort of a, a, a modern um, variant of a microscope. And uh, this is a cell undergoing mitosis. So in magenta there, you're, you're seeing um, a chromatin condensed into the you know, little chromosomes and they're about to divide in, in mitosis. And 
And in this uh, channel, we've got uh, microtubule tips. This, these are sort of structural element, for lack of a better uh, uh, term, that are, that are going to form the uh, mitotic spindle and, and pull apart the chromosomes. Awesome. So, right. Yeah, go ahead. I was just saying awesome. And also GFP for the win. I'm geeking out on my, my history. Yeah, solid knowledge there, Hugo. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Fluorescent <laughs> proteins are incredible, but that's for, that's for another, another chat. They are indeed. I, uh, yeah, so so exactly. This is a this is a cell expressing fluorescent proteins uh, acquired on a on a microscope with uh, fluorescence. Um, right, and so uh, you know, first we just see Napari, like most multidimensional viewers, has sliders for all the various dimensions. Um, we have the the concept of of layers over here, where we can look at um, multiple different data sets uh, uh, on top of each other, blended in various different ways. In this particular case, we're just looking at a couple image layers, but you know. Uh, we, we, the, the, one of the main points of Napari is that we can overlay analyses like points or vectors or surfaces or shapes, et cetera. Um, so that was just a, a quick, you know, opening an image with Napari. Nick, uh, feel free to just jump in at any point. Yeah, yeah no, this is great. I, I'm just, I just, yeah, loving looking at the images. Uh. <laughs> Okay, so that was just loading an image, but um, most of the time, you know, behind the scenes, we're, we're ultimately getting the data into some sort of NumPy interface, NumPy array, right? So um, you might have your own custom function that takes whatever data you have, gets it into a multidimensional NumPy array, and then, and then we can open it. So for instance, scikit image has their imread function. I can, I can read that TIFF into a NumPy array. And uh, so stack here is just a NumPy array. It's a three-dimensional NumPy array. And um, I can then use Napari's view image, uh, which is basically the same thing as what I did. And I get, I get a viewer again. Um, so keeping in mind that we just need something that takes a file, takes a data set, gives, gives me a NumPy array, um, that's, that's where we're starting with. And actually, I do want to point something out about this data set. This is a little strange. If I go through uh, Z here, I'm going through the third dimension as a, you know X Y image, and I'm going through the third dimension. You'll you'll see this thing kind of moves from left to right. That is an idiosyncrasy of the of the microscope that I'm using. Um, it acquires data in a strange uh, geometry, and I'm not going to really belabor this point, but just to show you here. Um, this is this is kind of how it is, where the imaging objective is viewing from this side over here. I'll go back here. And we go through Z by moving the stage from left to right there. You see that? So the, the third dimension is not actually orthogonal to the image plane. And, that, and therein lies the problem, is that we're acquiring images in this uh, skewed uh, geometry. Does that make sense? So the problem is now if we want to view that, we, we basically have our data in this kind of skewed geometry, but most image viewers assume you are viewing orthogonal data. And so if you just opened this in a naive uh, image viewer, it would, um, it would do what it's about to show here, right? Which would be a disaster. Uh, so like a lot of scientific data sets, we have some basic pre-processing that we need to do before we can even view the data, um, which is specifically a shearing operation as shown there to uh, an affine transform to put the data back into real world coordinates so we can do it. Okay, so this is just a this is just a placeholder for you need to do something to your data before you can view it, right? This is my domain, but 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 the point here is, you know, very often we collect data in some sort of format that needs some preprocessing. Um, in this case, the preprocessing, like I said, is an affine transform, and very often we'll also do some deconvolution to increase the contrast of the image um, or or cropping, et cetera. So I am just going to import a function here that um, does this affine transform, so dskew. And, and I'm, I'm doing it on the GPU here to make that part a little faster. That's not um, from Napari, but uh, hopefully in the, in, in the future, we'll have that sort of thing in Napari. And yeah, so if I just run this. Um, I'm sorry if I missed this. Where, where are your GPUs, or they're local? Everything that I'm showing today is local, yeah. Right. There's like five things I want to say right now. I'll just say them very briefly. First, thanks so much for the DSKU video. I've heard you guys talk about like, oh yeah, users that want to DSKU stuff so many times and I've never understood what it is that you mean. Oh, cool. Now I totally understand. Great. Awesome. That helped. Yeah, that was awesome. Okay. Uh, second, you were like, apologies that probably didn't have like DSKUing capabilities, but it's so awesome that you can just use Python to do DSKUing and then go to Napari. 
Okay, actually, things kind of work out. You don't have to be in a big monolith. This is like, that's the advantage of building a, a stack on top of the Python stack. Exactly. Right? I mean, that's what drew me to Napari. I, I'm, you know, I'm not one of the original developers, but it's not like there are alternatives out there, but this one for me, I can use the whole ecosystem and that was just a huge win. Yeah. My, my last question, and I actually kind of know the answer to this already because we talked earlier, but you see me running Mac uh, OS X and yet you have a GPU. How, how did that happen? It's also says it's a CUDA GPU. <laughs> it is. Um, yes, Apple and I, NVIDIA don't like each other. <laughs> what, what no, have you done? I, I'm running a Hackintosh and, and uh, I, I'm also unfortunately running um, uh, an, old, an old version because it's the last one that uh, was supported um, by, you know, the, the last version on which they all agreed. Okay. Um, so that's, that's what I'm running. Uh, okay, so uh, Basically, what I'm showing here is just is is the is the result of a, of a, of a deconvolution. Um, uh, we won't go into that, uh, but but basically, you know, I, I think most people, most of our viewers, probably know what that's all about. And and so here is is the end goal. And um, it's uh, I'm not showing you 3D here, but um, I will in just a second. Anyway, what I want to draw your attention to are just these functions, right? DSKU, GPU, and Decon. And I'm and I've and I've taken my original stack, I've applied uh, this DSKUing, and then I take that DSKUed stack and I apply deconvolution. And Tyler, are you doing this right now to one time point in the movie? Is that? Yes. And actually, you have led me to my next point, which is that uh, this is just a single image with a small field of view. But if I saved the raw data, if I saved the de-skewed so I didn't have to re de -skew it every time, and if I saved the deconvolved data, which everybody likes to look at and is the easiest one to sort of do segmentation on and, and, and processing, it quickly adds up. So, you know, my single stack is eight megabytes. Um, the de-skewed stack adds, you know, pads with a lot of useless zeros, but I need to have it, and that's 17 megabytes. That's a single channel. Deconvolved is the same size as the deskewed, but it doubles the bit depth. Um, but then we generally have, you know, two or three different channels, and often we have thousands of time points. So we're doing a time lapse experiment, and and that, you know, quickly we'll get up to hundreds of gigabytes, and we can collect that in 30 to 60 minutes, and we'll do that multiple times for a, a day, you know, and we do that, you know, we could do that every day. Um, and this is actually a relatively small data set for, for this modality. I mean, there's some folks at Genelia who are, who are using 2K by 2K with four cameras, you know, like it, it just goes up to terabytes and uh, uh, really, really quickly. So the point is it basically becomes impossible for me to view, you know, jump around, view the, how did this experiment end? Did the cell die? Did it, did it, did it, did it divide? You know, I need to evaluate my data and yet uh, simply looking at it um, is, is a bit hard. If only there was a project that could give you array-like functionality on top of large data sets. Right. Uh, if only. Um, so now is where I'm gonna I'm gonna start using Dask. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna, and I'll I'll actually get this um, open here. Do I bring this in here? Um, right. So. I'm going to just pull in Dask. I'm going to grab delayed and, and Dask array. And so most of what we're, we're going to show you here is just how awesome uh, uh, delayed and, and, and array is for us. I will, I, will, I will briefly remind you what delayed is. I suspe suspect most people here know what this is. But um, uh, this Dask delayed uh, function lets me take any function and wrap it in, in delayed. Usually, you can use it as a decorator, but we can also do stuff like this right here. So here I'm, I'm taking my imread function from scikit image, this thing that takes a file path, gives me an numpy array. I wrap that function in delayed and now I have a version of that function that is lazy, right? And I, and so I can, I can, um, yeah, so it, so it, it only gets called uh, uh, on, on demand. And I'm going to basically take a whole folder of files here, the whole entire data set, um, uh, wrap all of those in this lazy reader and then make a Dask array from those delayed objects. So now my, my Dask stack at the end of this, I, I just executed that cell. Obviously, it, it, it executed immediately because I'm not actually doing anything yet. I'm just basically declaring the shape of this experiment. So it's 100 time points, um, each, of, each of which is a, a 3D data set. And so that whole thing, not the whole data set just yet, but that's, that's um, about a game. 
And if I view that, it opens immediately and I can, I can kind of fly around here and you'll see on the right there, um, uh, you can see Desk doing some work in the background. Yeah? Yep. Exactly. Okay, so now I can sort of go through time and you can see the cell dividing um, and I'm only loading you know, what I need to um, uh, of that data set. But I actually, let me, let me show that again, because what I haven't shown you yet is, is that it's still a mess um, because I haven't yet de-skewed it. So if I rotate this in 3D, it's useless because it's still in this sheer geometry uh, off the microscope. And just for my, from my naivety, just to reiterate, are we, where you're loading each image as we need to view it as you scroll, right? So stuff to the right hand Z of, on the slider, we're not loading that until you go over there. Exactly right. Yeah. So that I, was, oh, go ahead. Yeah, that was it. You know, that was one of the the kind of the um, founding sort of concepts or fundamental concepts of of Napari was that we didn't want to kind of load in all the data into RAM right away and then mm. be limited because. As Tyler said, modern microscopy is just, you know, you, you, you turn on the, the, the hose and it just it comes out. And so, um, yeah, we wanted um, lazy loading um, as um, kind of first class um, thing. Right. Really well. And this is something you'll go through more, Nick, but this really speaks to like the interactive aspect of what, what you're doing with Napari, with, exactly. with large data sets. Mm -hmm. Really cool. From our perspective as developers, it's, it's, it's pretty darn easy. We just need to support, you know, we, we just need to be careful not to index into the array until, you know, absolutely necessary. And then we can kind of just naturally accept ask arrays. Yeah. Under the hood, it's, it's that we defer this kind of NP dot as array call until the very, very last minute. And so it's just the computation graph that's being um, sort of modified up till then. Yeah. Great. So, Getting back to this sequence of operations that we do, um, so, so that was just lazy reading of, of the data, but it's, as, as I said, it's, it's collected in this skewed geometry, so it's still not that, um, I can't really review it yet. Um, and so getting back to the, the, the de-skewing and perhaps the deconvolution, um, I can use Dask map, map blocks, uh, which is um, basically lets me uh, map a, a function across all of the chunks in my, in my Dask array. So I could, uh, in a lazy fashion again. So I, I can now take my Dask delayed array of, of commands to that basically you know, say when necessary, open this file and view it. And I can chain into that some processing. So I can say, not only should you open the file and view it, but you should open it, de-skew it, deconvolve it, and then show it to me. Um, and you know, as I move around the Napari slider, it will do that on, on demand. So I'm going to, uh, this is not that important. The, 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 the point here is that, uh, th this, is the, this is the crux of it down here is that, uh, um, well, actually down here is the crux of it, but um, I'm, I'm basically saying I've got these two functions and unfortunately uh, these are my functions and, and they're not that um, uh, flexible. They, they must have a three dimensional array. And so I am wrapping them in this little uh, helper function that basically takes my five dimensional, four dimensional blocks, temporarily puts it down to a three dimensional array and goes back. So this is just uh, my own limitation here. Um, but this is the meat of it here. I can basically take my Dask stack of, you know, delayed arrays and map this function, dskewed, and get out uh, a, a, a new lazy array that no, no computation has happened, but, but this, if I were to put this into Napari, I would now have my de-skewed. I can then take that again and map some blocks, uh, map, map a function across all the blocks uh, of deconvolution. Um, and what I get out was yet again, no computation, deconvolved uh, when, when, I, when I call compute on it. And then just to show I could, I could do this more, I can crop, right? So here's three, three things I might do to a data set before viewing it. And if I run that, again, it executes inst instantly because I haven't actually done anything. Um, you all know this trick. And then uh, now I can throw that into Napari and let's see what, we have, what happens. At this point, it's a little bit slower because um, these things are not super fast. I'll, I'll open this on the, on, the, on the left side here just so you can see. This is now calling the GPU in the background. And when I say go to a different time point, you can see over here is the, the deconvolution. Over on the right, you can see Dask doing some work. And 
Importantly, if I go to 3D here now, you'll see that it actually, oops, sorry, I was in 3D already. Right now, this thing looks like a cell should look. Uh, it's been de-skewed. It's a little, the contrast has been bumped up a little bit by the deconvolution. And I can, I can go to any point now here and watch, uh, watch this thing. Right. Um, and we can cache this, you know, we can use opportunistic caching from desks that, that makes it so that, you know, as I load these in, into, into, into RAM, if I have enough RAM, I, I, can, I can view them. But in most cases, the data set's gonna be too big, right? All right, um, I'll just give a shout out here. I mean, that, that's basically the crux of it. So we've got, you know, a function that takes a path, gives me an umpire array, that's scikit Im image im read. We wrap that in delayed. We make an array of those with Dask array. We give that to Napari, and uh, and Napari does the rest. Um, uh, and or we can uh, throw in a few map blocks uh, sequences there to do some processing uh, lazily. So the a couple of comments. There's a question also in the chat. Yeah, uh, it comes from me. So it was actually it's really fun seeing sort of Dask in the loop, right? Like when you were fir the first time you were sort of scrolling around, and it was really smooth. It was a fun seeing Dask on the side. Like doing computation for you in that sort of like sub 10, sub 50 millisecond range where it appears smooth. And like now when we're doing this like more heavy operation, it's not smooth. Not like that makes us feel bad. Like we're not going to be enjoying that experience as a you know, a bench scientist looking at this thing. Exactly. And so it's it's kind of fun for me as a technologist. So like this problem, like, oh great, if I can make my code faster, like scientists will enjoy this experience more. And they'll look at it more, they'll explore more, they'll dive in and see, you know, whatever structure actual scientists see in here. Yeah. Um, so that's fun. I just, I love the sort of computation, computation in, the, in the human loop process. Yeah. Yeah. So and I'm not sure if you were pointing this out, but there's definitely work to be done here, right? Like this, this is, this is good, uh, uh, but, but we can, we can still improve things. It's skipping a lot of frames here, right? Yeah. Just because there's a lot of data to load. It looks like, so, so those purple functions are deconvolution maybe? Yeah, those are those are the decon. Yeah, so we're thinking. working on some things to improve the asynchronicity um, of processing and some decoupling of some of the rendering and the processing, so that when you have larger um, uh, compute like this, things can stay uh, interactive. Yeah, I also love that I've never used Napari, but that the code you wrote is code that I know and love and it's very Pythonic um, and it, it all makes sense to me. And there's a relatively small amount you had to do to, to generate all of this, this wonderful stuff. Yeah, and actually I, I, I kind of showed you the hard way um, uh, just, just for, for educational purposes. Appreciate that. A lot of this can be, be wrapped and, and I'll, I'll give a shout out to Dask Image here, which uh, um, from, from John Kirkham and many others, um, which is a great package that wraps a lot of what I just kind of showed you, uh, this, this lazy imread um, functionality in, in a package. So basically everything I just showed you could more or less be done like this. This is, this is wrapping, this is not mapping the blocks yet, but this is, this is just doing the reading, this imread, um, I give it a file format uh, glob pattern. And uh, there's mapping the blocks. And uh, so this is the same thing, just done with uh, two different channels. Where's my viewer? There it is. Right. Um, so that's that's the two channels now. Um, but Dask Image is an awesome wrapper on basically the functionality I just showed you there. And I'll, I'll right. also mention that from Napari's perspective, once you get something like that, something that takes a path and gives back a Dask array or an NumPy array, uh, you can wrap all that functionality in in a Napari plugin. So Napari plugins are ever evolving, but some of the first ones were IO plugins that um, uh, let you define a function that takes a path, gives me back a, a Dask array or, or a NumPy array. And um, so this one is an example of exactly what I just showed you. Uh, uh, so, so you can kind of wrap all that functionality for someone, which as, as long as it can recognize that, yeah, this is a file that I should be handling, uh, allows someone to literally just drag and drop the, the, the folder or a zip file or whatever onto the Napari viewer and it'll take care of the rest. And a cool thing, actually, I think it goes to something that Hugo maybe climbs in. Um, although, you know, that is a, a Napari plugin that we can use in Napari. Correct me if I'm wrong, Tyler, but I think on the inside, it's pretty much just, um, you know, Python DAS calls that you can use without any GUI or an entirely headless mode as well. Um, so yeah, there's absolutely nothing Napari specific. Um, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, it doesn't depend on Napari at all. It doesn't even depend on Napari, yeah. And that's been one of our goals as well, is to, is to kind of integrate with the rest of the Python ecosystem um, so that uh, things can be you know, easily reused. And, uh, yeah, that's a good point. Question from the chat uh, from Kirthi Prakash. Uh, did you use Micromanager to acquire data or something Python-based? Also, uh, how possible is real-time data processing? Uh, I'll answer the first one. That that um, that was acquired on the Lattice Lightsheet software written by Dan Milky at, at, at Genelia. Um, so that was a lab view based uh, uh, non-Python non acquisition software. Dan, Dan Milky is a, is, a, is a genius of, of uh, lab view acquisition software. So sh shout out to him on that. Um, as far as uh, real time processing, I mean, uh, actually, Nick, we, and we, we were just recently discussing some, some kind of real time viewing stuff. Go, go ahead. And that. Yeah, I mean, so you know, there's real time acquisition where, um, uh, you know, just to give a little bit of context for people that maybe aren't familiar with Micromanager, um, you know, that's an open source software for acquiring images. And, um, you know, although the project, the Pi project's been kind of say focused so far on just the, the visualization and analysis side, um, acquisition is, you know, an incredibly important part of microscopy and imaging. And, um, you know, being able to bring, um, you know, some of this power and some of this technology to an acquisition context, I think would be really, really exciting um, as well. So. Yeah. Any other questions? That's it. We've just got a comment from perhaps someone you know, Jackson Brown. Yes. We do. Yeah. Jackson. Jackson says one of the things that um, they and, and you have found with Napari Dask and image stuff is that the Dask array chunking really matters when, when viewing in Napari and, and something that you all are working on. And yeah, shout out to you know, an amazing plugin that Jackson made from the Allen Institute of Cell Science. Um, that um, can read in um, uh, big uh, Zeiss files into um, NumPy or Dask as well. And so, um, yeah, really cool, cool stuff from, from him in that. Um, yeah, I think for microscopy, it's kind of interesting. There's this kind of question of um, chunking and um, you know, thinking about the major interaction patterns you're gonna have with that um, imaging data set. You know, if you only ever know that you're gonna be looking at 2D slices, then maybe you'll think about chunking one way if you know that sometimes you'll be looking at this slice, this slice, sometimes the 3D volume, maybe chunk that way. And, um, uh, you know, we, 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 we have work to do on the Napari end to do better things like um, 3D rendering of really big images as well. So, yeah, actually, I, I want to say something there because uh, there's, a, there's a really interesting interplay from my perspective of doing what we can with the file formats we're given and thinking forward to the next generation file format, right? Like I, we can do a lot of great things with, I, like I wish we were all using sort of chunk format like czar or something like that, but the average person who walks through my door isn't immediately familiar with that. And, and if I send them out the door with, with a novel file type that, that they can't necessarily read without you know, knowing the whole stack, um, we might have problems, right? And so one of the things I particularly like about this pattern here is I don't necessarily get all the benefit. I, I definitely don't get all the benefits of, of a modern chunk format, but I can achieve some 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 nice lazy lazy and and and, and quasi chunking, right? If I, I can even wrap it in some sort of czar like uh, store to to achieve uh, that sort of thing, and it allows me to leave them with a file format they're comfortable with while achieving at least some of the the, the niceties I, I might want want to achieve. So One of the nice things about things like czar is it lets you read data from remote data sources like S3 yeah. using yeah. That, czar. Yeah. Oh, hey, <laughs> what are we going on the screen here? <laughs> so this is just a little two cell uh, example. Um, I mean, this is basically the same pattern we were just showing where, you know, we have a file path and we, and we wrap it in a Dask uh, uh, delayed array. So in this case, we're just, um, I have some data on S3 uh, and Dask array provides this from czar, which uses FS spec behind the scenes to, to, um, uh, uh, get a czar store on, on um, uh, what happened there, uh, from, from S3. Yeah, okay, so this is now, again, we're going to be a little, um, uh, can, you, can you maximize that? It looks like a pretty yes. image, but it might be fun to her to see it more probably. Yes, so these are just, uh, some uh, neurons and immune cells, and actually, I'll, I'll go 3D here. And you'll see, actually, I, I clicked it a second ago, and 
there. So that was almost oh. three or four seconds. That was the amount of time to, to load um, this, this relatively large 3D image from, from S3. So again, we, we, got, we have challenges, but this is you know, many tens of gigabytes on S3 and I don't have to download it every one time I wanna look at it. And I can at least say, what was that data set? Um, uh, I, can, I can do some pre-processing on a single time point, say, are my parameters working? Um, uh, and then and then run it, you know, on the cloud for for the rest of it. Yeah, Nick. No, that was it. Yeah, sorry, that was that was that was the running going up to the cloud. That was the batch processing um, uh, going up to the cloud. Sorry. Yeah. So um, and 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 yeah. So so that you know that can be just to show you like what I just showed you there can be wrapped in a plugin, and this is literally the entire plugin. So um, that uh, it it you can. That plugins don't need to be that complicated, basically. Just something that takes a path and gives me back a task. Uh, Nick, do you want to take yeah, over? Yeah, maybe let's switch over and I'll, I'll sort of talk a little bit about this uh, pathology example and some of the kind of interactive analysis um, that we were mentioning. So let me share my screen too. So, all right. So here um, I've got some data that's um, also in a, in a ZAR um, uh, format. It could actually be... Um, Someone in the, in the community, um, as Trevor has written a really nice um, uh, plugin for reading um, the raw kind of open slide to format. But here, this is something that, that's already in, in, in a ZAR format. And um, it's multi-resolution. And right now, I'm just going to represent that multi-resolution data as a list of DASC arrays, where um, the first pyramid is, um, um, or the first um, array here is the largest. So this is actually 80 gigs. It's really big. It's hundreds of thousands by hundreds of thousands of pixels and you know 300 chunks. It's RGB. Um, and then at the very top, we have a really small low resolution and you know it's factors of two uh, going along um, along the way. And um, again, I'm going to create um, first here an, an empty um, uh, Napari viewer. Um, and uh, give that a second here. And then um, just add this pyramid um, to it. OK, so here, this is just um, a pyramid that's being looked at um, as a ZAR file via Dask. And so you know, kind of Google Map style, we're zooming in and zooming out. And it's like swapping the level of the um, pyramid, the, the resolution level as it needs. Uh, um, and what's a pyramid, Nick? Ah, uh, yeah. So pyramid is image pyramid in this context. Sorry. So image pyramid, it's um, different levels of resolution. So if you think that at the lowest um, um, or the highest resolution, um, this image is you know hundred thousand by two hundred thousand. Then if you have a factor of two um, pyramid, then the next level is fifty thousand by a hundred thousand. Then it's twenty five by a hundred, and sort of so on. And so each time you're you're decreasing your size, in this case, by a factor of four. And mm. um, it's a pre-computed pyramid. And uh, pre-computing the pyramid is really helpful. Um, it's actually stored in the file format that way because um, it can be slow to recompute compute um, on the fly. But as I zoom in and out, um, you know, again, we're kind of leveraging the same lazy loading that we were doing before. But instead of like lazy loading with different time points, like Tally was showing in the last example, now we're lazy loading with different tiles of the pyramid. And um, you know, as far as I mean, just a, a, a you know, multi-resolution viewer goes, there are many, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a standard concept for um, many viewers out there, but I'm gonna show in a minute is this kind of interactive analysis um, uh, uh, kind of take on it. Um, first, just to talk about what this data is though, is it's a, um, a pathology slide. Um, it's like a part of a lymph node. Uh, unfortunately, there's a tumor in it, um, which is um, which is right here, and um, you can sort of see how these cells are different than those cells. And um, you know, a very common task that people might want to do with this data are uh, like identify the tumor. Um, you know, we're not going to go through a workflow that that's that complex in this time, but you know, just thinking about what are the things that um, uh, pathologists um, might want to do. Um, and um, so. Let me zoom out. Okay, that's that. We go back to the notebooks. That was just looking at the image. Um, another thing someone might want to do is uh, some segmentation. Um, you know, identify different cells, different nuclei, and uh, I have an incredibly simple um, one um, here where I'm just going to look at the red channel of the RGB data, and I'm going to take a little threshold um, and uh, you know binarize the image if the uh, if there's um, you know 
depending on how much red is in the red channel. And so that's this little function here. And then I'm going to apply that function to um, every level in the pyramid with a map blocks um, and um, uh, just a, one particular, and I'm gonna pick one particular value for threshold 100. Um, and um, let me sort of do that. And so- And while you're doing that, we just have a quick yeah. question about this. What, what yeah. microscope um, was used to acquire this data? Yeah, so that's from a whole slide um, image. And so let me actually, I can just, um, Chameleon 17. So this data comes from the Camellia 17 uh, Grand Challenge data sets, uh, the whole slide right. images. And um, they actually have annotations. Actually, there's a nice picture in here that's probably, it's probably worth the, um, the one second it takes me to, Oh, that's the Google Drive link. Nope, not one. Um, more than one second, Nick. More than one, one second. One second. <laughs> that was a nice picture of a pyramid. Well, we you. nearly ended up in Google Drive as well. That was a trip. Yeah, we could have. Uh, yeah, the way we could have. Uh, oh, here's a pyramid. So here's like the different concepts of the pyramid. Oh yeah, cool. It is a pyramid. It is a pyramid. Yeah, that's why they call it a pyramid. Um, so um, yeah, that's 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 nice. That and uh, let's see if I look now at the um, first level of this thresholded pyramid. Uh, it's a binary image now um, and um, it's smaller in size, it's not RGB and uh, we can add it to the, um, the viewer. Mm -hmm. And what's cool now is um, if I zoom in, you can sort of see um, here that um, in brown, um, we've kind of done this thresholding but we didn't have to do the threshold on every pixel on the image. You know, if I'd wanted to apply this to you know all hundred thousand by two hundred thousand pixels, um, it would have been really you know it would have taken some time. Um, instead, we're using Dask and this concept of lazy um, evaluation to just apply it whenever I need it to see it and whatever level of the pyramid I'm kind of looking at. And um, so you know. Now, if you want to think about doing something kind of interactive, something exploratory, um, you know, you don't have to wait to run it on the whole entire data set. And so let me close this. Let me kind of do another one. Um, I'm going to use some functionality from a package called Magic GUI that Tali um, has written that uh, basically makes it really easy to kind of create um, reusable widgets that you can put into Napari. There are QT widgets. Um, and so I'm going to create one now um, that is going to have a slider that I can um, use to control that threshold value that I mentioned before. And so let me recreate um, Napari again. And so now I've got this here, but now I've got this threshold at the bottom. Then I sort of zoom in a little bit, just a little bit in. Um, and now, you know, maybe I don't like this value of the threshold. Maybe I'm going to click here. Maybe that sort of um, uh, click there, um, and uh, you know I can maybe kind of fine tune it to find a number that I like, and um, you know I can now see. All right, this is how it went on this part of the data set, but you know maybe let me look at how it went on um, you know this part of the data set, um, you know out out here or, or something. And, and um, again, instead of having to um, uh, you know, evaluate it on the whole thing or just try and find one parameter, I can kind of interactively um, pick and choose values that I, I like. So in this case, you're running a really simple thresholding uh, yeah. labeling function. There's yeah. a question in the chat, you know, can, can Dask and Napari be helpful using uh, deep learning tools like Keras uh, to predict uh, different values? So yeah. is that a place where you fit, fit, fit that in? Yeah, so I um, I have an example that uses, um, there's a really cool segmentation tool, um, uh, Stardust, that's written in TensorFlow. Um, and um, I have an example using that um, in a lazy fashion with Napari as well. Um, it, that example actually doesn't use Dask. It um, is lazy on loading in different um, uh, files. But, um, you know, under the hood, you know, we, we can take in any um, array-like object. So we can, you can um, use um, PyTorch arrays and TensorFlow um, arrays as well. And um, there's a cool example online from one of the other main Napari um, team members and a Scikit image maintainer, Juan uh, Nunez Iglesias, where um, he has a kind of tensor board style example where you're training, you're actually able to even do the training in Napari and watch the kind of the curve, uh, watch the error 
sort of go down um, as your predictions get better and better. Um, but I mean, I think another point here worth pointing out is just, again, being on the Python stack, right? I think a lot of the benefit of Napari here is, is specifically with regards to machine learning is the ease in incorporating the entire machine learning eco ecosystem because the tool is just, you know, pure Python. And I'll say, I'll, 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 okay. Yeah, I was just gonna ask more generally, what is the adoption of Python tools in, in biological research like these days? Because I remember six years ago, it was becoming more, more prevalent, but it definitely, I mean, image J was huge at that point as well. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I think there, are, I think there's a lot of excitement. I think there are still, um, you know, barriers for getting the Python data stack to, um, uh, you know, some scientists say that um, you know want to leverage a lot of the advances, but um, you know don't want to deal with some of the install pains and install troubles that um, you know I think we often encounter, or um, you know don't want to get to that level of coding and. I think we're hoping that a tool like Napari through its GUI can actually um, uh, bring and introduce people to the Python data stack um, a little bit more. We have an integrated console as well. You kind of saw the use with the Jupyter Notebook. Um, and Italia, your kind of perspective on that. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, like Fiji and, and ImageJ are still huge tools and, 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 and provide tremendous amount of value. Um, uh, Python is growing obviously rapidly. If you look at any of the numbers, it, it's 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 massive. Um, I, I think uh, one of the pain points with Fiji is it, it, even though you can sort of code in Python is exactly the fact that you can't use NumPy directly, right? Because it uses JSON and it's sort of a contained environment. So um, I don't know, I, Python is growing a lot for sure. Yeah, and we seek to integrate um, and expose those machine learning libraries uh, really to, to people for sure. When I talk about, I, I talk about Napari often, because not because I am particularly conversant in image visualization, because I love that it is an example of an application that we use with Python that is not a Jupyter notebook, right? Like you are supporting not data scientists, not data engineers, you're supporting the actual lab bench scientists who are not programmers. Yeah. And it's a, there's, there's probably an order of magnitude of people who you know, could be using these tools, but aren't. Yeah. Yeah, so I think Napari is uh, kind of like Excel, maybe in that way. Uh, in, in the best way possible, mm -hmm. in that it's an accessibility tool uh, that mm -hmm. sort of brings all the work that we've all been working on for a decade or two, uh, and now like exports it to a much, a very different community. And yeah. it's really awesome seeing products like Napari come up more and more often. I do that. Absolutely. Export. And I, I think there's a, you know, there's a larger vision for some of this um, uh, kind of interactivity and plugins that I think Tally's sort of been, been alluding to where, um, you know, we really want to think about helping a, a scientist with the whole workflow of steps. It's really could be very complex and, um, you know, potentially chaining those together in lazy computation graphs, you know, picking which part of the graph you want to look at, you know, already an example that Tally showed, you, you know, there was the, the de-skew, then the deconvolve, but, you know, it just keeps on going after the deconvolve. Maybe there's a registration, maybe there's a segmentation, maybe there's a tracking. Um, and, um, you know, thinking of those, um, you know, think of building those um, via kind of plugins in a, in a compute graph and then saying, oh, well, I just want lazy evaluation and I just want to look at, you know, this particular one and, um, or the, you know, the, the output of the, the segmentation on this slice, this time point, um, you know, empowering people to do that um, is, I think, a big goal. I think another uh, principle we, I know, I, I, I like about Napari is, is, um, while we very much want the GUI to to be uh, the the center, right, and and, and open to everybody, I think uh, it, it is also useful for uh, intermediate Python users, right? To to you know, if there's one guy in the lab or girl in the lab who knows how to like do a thing or two, they can sort of write a plugin or extend Napari for the whole lab, and then the whole lab can just use the GUI, as uh, you know. So. so uh, I didn't put that very well, but but the, the point is uh, most of the things we export are pure Python types, and you don't need to learn a complicated framework to extend the bar. Right? You just we we the goal is to make everything as as simple of a function uh, as, as possible to 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 uh, get the lowest barrier of entry yeah. to slightly extending the program. I really like that sort of that dual that dual role uh, activity. Like the people who are using Napari, there are features in Napari that are designed for you, who are presumably supporting a bunch of other. Yeah. Main scientists who do not understand those features. Yeah. I'm actually curious. So 
you presumably both work with, or maybe Tyler, maybe you more work with biologists on site. Maybe you do too, Nick. I'm not sure of your various roles. Uh, what do they, what do they like about it? I assume people are using it. If so, like what do they like about it? What don't they like about it? How could it improve? What's the experience like? Uh, well, for me, uh, you know, I, I sort of got into this late late last year, and uh, I really haven't seen many people, say, you know, since like March. Um, uh, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the in the in the in the work from home, uh, you know, uh, context. Um, I, I think you know there are definitely things that, that you know are up and coming in in the prior. Um, you know, Tally's been doing some amazing work on a bundled app to um, allow for easy installation. So that's something I think that we're really excited about. Um, and I think that will help us, you know, reach a, a larger audience. Um, uh, you know, we've got some early people working on um, both those I/O plugins, but also kind of building um, their own custom widgets to extend the power in their own custom way. And I think we definitely want to do more work um, to make that smoother and easier, and really, um, yeah, kind of have that that place for experimentation and, and playing um, um, with new functionality there. So. Yeah. I think relevant to the, the bundle app, we have a question from Kirti again. Kirti says, in our lab, Im Imaris is, a very pop is very popular, especially for visualization of LSM data, mainly due to its click button uh, uh, approach. How, how do you see Napari competing with it? The click button approach? Um, Maybe just like the ease that you just like click and it works. That's kind of how I yeah. interpret that, yeah. that question. That's, that's what I thought that, yeah, yeah. kind of yeah. click. I think we really want to, you know, we we want to take Napari there to that point and click on, um, you know, for those users. But we want to then also enable those, you know, incredible algorithm develop developers to share what they're doing um, as part of this open source ecosystem, and um, you know, really um, kind of be able to bridge those uh, those gaps so that you can have the development yeah. and the point and click um, GUI experience. Is yeah, that, Mars, is go ahead. Was well, that William in the chat is jumping your defense, saying that he wouldn't want to do annotations in MRs? Yeah, you know, yeah, it's um, yeah, there's there's definitely a, um, you know, complexity with um, uh, a, a lot of these tools, and um, you know, we support you know basic like painting and paint brushes and points, but I, I think what's kind of fun is um, it's really easy then to get those annotations. Um, out of Napari and into Python as well. Um, and so you, you can kind of just keep on going um, with them there. Um, I had a general question around, I, I, I get the sense a lot of people viewing um, have some experience with, with Napari, but um, for those that don't, um, and maybe for people who are beginners, what are some next steps they can do? How can they get more involved? Um, are there places to contribute as well? Absolutely, yeah, maybe, yeah, that's, I'm so glad you even up. So, um, we have our website, napari.org, and um, you know that's um, a place um, where you can find some of our um, tutorials. Um, there is also um, recently, Tally and I participated in a, a new bias training academy, um, and they we, we produce an um, introductory to Napari, kind of like an hour and a half sort of tutorial um, session that's that's online and and um, that's linked to um, from there. Um, we also absolutely love new contributors. We're incredibly welcoming. We hope to be, we want to be incredibly welcoming uh, to new contributors. And uh, on the GitHub, um, we have issues tagged with um, good first issue um, to, you know, if you want to dive in um, and, and work on something, um, you know, particularly um, through the plugins now, I think we're really excited. I think there's, you know, also people that, um, you know, we want to hear about your plugin ideas and your plugin needs. Um, you can find us too on the image.sc forum um, under the um, kind of hashtag Napari there. Maybe if um, you don't mind, I, I quickly share my screen and share yeah, more of these classes just to say, um, you know, because it's a lot to find um, some of them always. So yeah, image.sc. This is a, for the bio image analysis community, a really amazing place to learn about a whole host of imaging tools. And so Napari, we're one of the tools on here. And this is a great place um, if you have questions about um, how to use um, Napari or applications you have in mind. And then the GitHub as well, um, you know, um, a lot of open issues, PRs, um, or, or welcome and, and Napari.org. Uh, we're also on Twitter um, under the Napari imaging um, uh, handle and we, we tweet out releases and things. 
Great. And why the name Napari? I don't know if we, we cover this. I don't know if I know the answer. So, yeah, it's a great story. So the origin of, um, of Napari was a, as an idea that um, two people that aren't on this call, um, Juan Nunez Iglesias and, and Loic Rayed, um, that I mentioned, um, who are on the Napari Steering Council. I think um, I mentioned to you last time, which had actually know Loic from my days living and working in Dresden, Germany. No way, that's so ago. funny. So, okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I'm sure, I'm, I'll say hello to Loic. I'm sure he'll Please do. catch yeah. this out. So, you know, Loic and, and Juan, um, you know, Loic, someone that had been doing a lot of Java development, um, Juan maintaining scikit image, and, and uh, I think they were both excited about this concept of a um, image viewer in um, Python, and they were having a conversation um, when Juan was visiting Loic in um, California in San Francisco, where he lives, and Juan lives in Australia, and they were like, this could be the perfect collaboration for us, let's, uh, and, you know, they were trying to think of a name, and I think one of them threw out the, the idea of, like, okay, what's halfway between San Francisco and Australia, and I think they looked on, a, on the map, and they found um, an island in a city, Napari, and they thought that, you know, as a sort of symbol of this international collaboration um let's go with that uh, with this as as the name and um, that's really cool not to mention the allusion to uh fiji of course exactly which... well there's a deeper yeah. level than that a uh, little little yeah. maybe in joke that layers that referencing uh, to... pyramid of references exactly um we, we've got a couple of minutes left we've got a couple of couple of questions um there's a great question about what's what's on the napari roadmap where is development being focused or, or can we link to it yeah, that is a link to that. That is a Napari roadmap. Um, it's on that um, napari.org um, website um, under the developer resources. And we're actually going to be improving our, our website soon to, to make some of these things more discoverable. Um, you know, definitely we're thinking um, about things like uh, support for multiple canvases eventually for people that want um, you know, multi, um, multi views. Um, this bundled app that I mentioned is, I think, you know, really um, imminent now. Um, and um, yeah, there's a, a, a list of features there. Great. We have one other question from, from Tracking Tools, which is, is a great name on, on, on YouTube in general. I think um, some people book workstations just to view um, 4D images in Imerus um, because it's heavier to open in, in Fiji on normal computers. Dask with Napari on their Macs would be enough to open giga to terabyte data sets? So it really, so there's one, there's one caveat which I just want to point out, which is if it's a 3D rendering and you need to have the full 3D thing right now, we don't do a good job with that. We're still, we're going to be act, so on the roadmap um, is better async um, processing and a better opt tree for uh, rendering. So if you have a big um, time series where each thing is small in time, then the Pari and Dash should be great. Um, if you have something which each piece is really big, but it's kind of fundamentally 2D, like I showed, then we should be great. If you have something that's like big and 3D, we still have work to do, but that's on the roadmap. I know Tyler, if you want to expand on that. Well, I was just going to say a lot of people in this domain are probably familiar with tools like Big Data Viewer, which is an amazing tool to let you take arbitrary oblique slices through a through an n-dimensional data set, and that's the kind of thing that we we don't do at the moment. That that um, you know we'd like to in the future, but don't expect to be able to do that kind of thing immediately. Cool, thank you. Um, there's just something else that came to mind. You, uh, Nick, work at- Chan Zuckerberg. Chan Zuckerberg. Yeah. I was trying to figure out whether to say CZI or CZI. Yeah, yeah I know, it's sort of, yeah, uh, yeah, CZI. You know, as, <laughs> sure. Yeah, um, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but there's actually a, a position open for, yes. for Dask funded by CZI currently. That was, so that, yeah, so that, let me talk about, mention a couple of things. So um, we have, a CZI position open. I think the Dask team, is that what you're referencing? Maybe, maybe Matt, do you want to take yeah. that side of the question and I'll take the other side? Or sure. If you're yeah. referencing that, the, 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 so CZI is an organization, we both support um, open source software through grant mechanisms. And I think there's a position that the Dask team has that through one of those grants um, that maybe Matt wants to mention. Um, yep, we are interviewing for that now, if you think we're a great candidate shoot me an email, but we're also like, we're zeroing in on the folks. It's actually been an amazing set of people in this intersection between open source and biology. It's a, it's a great field to, to see people come out of. And then at the same time, so the team I'm on um, at CZI, we also actually have an open position right now for a software engineer. 
uh, that's more uh, front end focused um, than, um, uh, than than exactly the the the, the this uh, sort of task intersection. But you know, we do think a lot about um, you know the, the team that team is going to be growing as well, and so I can share resources um, to that. and and just to say you know. TCI, we've been um, supporting this project now for, for a while and uh, you know, very excited about the opportunities that it, it's providing. Um, Fantastic. So if anyone's interested, definitely reach out. Um, closing, closing remarks, if, if you're interested in, in, in doing uh, this type of stuff and any form of data science at scale and want to check out our, our hosted deployments at Coiled, please do check out our beta product. And I think that dovetails nicely into what we're doing next week on, on Science Thursday. Um, no, not necessarily, because things have been pushed back a little bit because of launch. I want to. I want to hold off on that announcement, Hugo. Ah, okay. Well, to be announced, the suspense <laughs> is now killing me. I want to announce it. Yeah. Well, in, maybe I'll say in the near future. It may be next week. It may be the week after. <laughs> uh, Matt and I will be doing a demo of Coiled with a panel of friendly hecklers who will um, throw verbal tomatoes at us at, <laughs> at, at the very least. Um, yeah, ideally friendly hecklers for, for what that's worth. Um, yeah, um, great. Well, um, thank you all for, for joining and hope to see you very soon on a Science Thursday. And thank you to our, our, our wonderful guests for taking us through such a great tour of Nepal. Thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure. Uh, yeah, really yeah. fun here.